Hey everybody, I know the world right now is talking about Trump and Hillary because election day was yesterday, but I want to talk about something I consider much more exciting. Today in the church's liturgical calendar is the feast of the dedication of the Lateran Basilica in Rome. Why is this exciting? Why is this important? Because the Lateran Basilica in Rome is considered the mother of all the churches around the world, the mother church of the whole world. And the theology of the body shines a beautiful light for us on what this means that the church is both mother and bride. You'll see in the church's liturgy today, lots of references to the church as mother and the church as bride. Let me read to you what is inscribed in the baptismal font in the Lateran Basilica in Rome. And this will illuminate for us what it means that the church is mother and bride. So, inscribed in the bat baptistry of the Pope's Cathedral, keep in mind the Lateran Basilica in Rome, contrary to what a lot of people think, uh, we naturally think St. Peter's is the Pope's Basilica, but it's not. It's the Lateran Basilica in Rome, which is where the church's uh, where the Pope's uh, cathedra is, his chair, the chair of Peter, is at the Lateran Basilica. Uh, so we, we read here in the Lateran Basilica, in the baptismal font, it says, At this font, the church, our mother, gives birth from her virginal womb to the children she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pause right there. Did you know? that every baptismal font in every church around the world, the church has always understood that baptismal font to be symbolic of the church's womb. The church is our mother. The church is the bride of Christ. And in being bride, she bears numerous spiritual children. And we are those spiritual children. When we are baptized, we are born again. And in order to understand what it means to be born again, we have to understand what it means to be born the first time because grace builds on nature, right? Remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. And Nicodemus is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't get this stuff? If you don't understand the natural reality, Jesus says to Nicodemus, how are you going to understand the heavenly reality? If you don't understand the things of earth, how are you going to understand the things of heaven? Right here, Jesus is boldly proclaiming theology of the body. The natural reality of conception and birth becomes the foundation, the natural foundation in which we, in which we understand the heaven real, heavenly reality, the supernatural reality of conception and birth. All of us, to enter the kingdom, we have to be born again. This means we have to be conceived again and come into the world through a new father and a new mother. All of us are born of the original Adam and Eve, right? We're going to use the biblical story. We must be born again of the new Adam and the new Eve, and this brings us back to this mystery right here, which I always refer to. You'll see in my videos, you'll hear in my teachings, you'll see in my books, this image, the nuptial cross. This is where the new Adam and the new Eve, Christ and the church, consummate their mystical marriage. And this is where we are born again. What does the new Adam, the new Adam, say to the new Eve? Woman, behold your son. The beloved disciple is the mystical offspring of the mystical marriage of the new Adam and the new Eve. And so are we. So are we when we are born again through the mystery of baptism. The church becomes our mother. God is our father, perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. And our bodies tell this story. Our bodies are not only biological, our bodies are theological. Our bodies proclaim these mysteries. How so? Well, let's start here. Why is God always the bridegroom and the father? 
Why is the church always the bride and the mother? This is very, very important. And our bodies tell the story. Look at a man's body. It's the man who gives the seed that leads to new life. It's the bride who opens to receive that seed, conceive the new life, and bear it forth. What story does this tell? This is love. Not that we first love God, but that he first loved us. Our bodies are theological, not merely biological. Our bodies tell this glorious story. What glorious story? God wants to marry us. God wants to marry us. Not only does he love us, he wants to marry us. And not only does he want to marry us, he wants to fill the bride with eternal life. This is the mystery revealed through our bodies. And we see this beautifully, powerfully in the church's celebration today, the dedication of the Lateran Basilica in Rome. Let's just take a quick look at some of the prayers and readings that the church offers us today in this glorious celebration. So, here's the entrance antiphon of Mass today. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. That bride is the church. That new Jerusalem is the church. And the church is embodied in the mystery of Mary, in the mystery of the new Eve at the foot of the cross and assumed into heaven and clowned, (laughs) clowned with the stars. No, crowned with the stars, crowned with the stars and the moon under her feet. And remember the woman in the book of Revelation, that new Jerusalem, that new Zion, that fulfillment of the church, that biblical woman is pregnant. She's pregnant. This is the theology of the body in all its glory. The mystery of the two becoming one flesh and bringing life into the world. This proclaims the gospel message. The Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman and the call to be fruitful and multiply. And it ends with this heavenly vision of the marriage of the lamb, of the fruitful bride in the apocalypse. Here's uh, from the collect today in uh, the church's liturgy. O God, you were pleased to call your church the bride. Pleased to call your church the bride. What does it mean, even at a deeper level, to say we are the bride of God? What does that mean? It means if we can even dare to enter and fathom this mystery. Not only does God love us, he wants to enter into us. This is the mystery of the bride. The bride is the one who is open to the bridegroom, receives the bridegroom within her. The mystical marriage of Christ and the church is consummated in the Eucharist. This is so holy. This is so sacred what our bodies reveal. The mystery of woman's openness, the mystery of the woman receiving the bridegroom within her. Within her, we are called to receive the mystery of the heavenly bridegroom within us. We take God in us. This is what God desires for us. This is why we are bride. God wants to dwell in us. In us. Astounding. Utterly astounding. Mary reveals this fully in her pregnancy, where she has God within. This is the perfect image of the church the church as the temple of God, the dwelling of God. And the, the readings today that the church gives us bear this beautiful truth out. The first reading is from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, and he's talking about the entrance to the temple. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be fulfilled in the gospel reading today, the temple ultimately refers to the body, to our bodies, right? So the angel brings Ezekiel to, this, to the entrance of the temple, and he sees this water flowing out of the temple. Think of what happens when a woman is giving birth. She is the temple. uh, And Mary, of course, fulfills this mystery. It really and truly is God dwelling within her. But every, every pregnant woman reveals this mystery. John Paul II said, Every child conceived under the beating heart of a woman is a reminder to the whole world of the mystery of the incarnation. And what happens when a woman gives birth? 
the temple flows with water. The temple flows with water. What's Ezekiel talking about here? The temple flowing with water. And what happens in these waters? Wherever the river flows, every sort of living creature that can multiply shall live. Right? There's that call to be fruitful and multiply. This temple flowing with water. It's all a symbol of life-givingness. And right as I'm saying this, the sun outside my window is shining brightly on my face. Maybe a little sign? Maybe a little sign? Who knows? Yes, indeed. I'm going to go with it. Because the sun, the sun, the scripture says it. The sun is the symbol of the bridegroom. The sun comes forth like a bridegroom from its chambers, scripture says. The sun comes forth like a bridegroom from its chambers. Nothing is concealed from its burning heat. The church prays to the east in her liturgy. Why? Because the church is the bride open to the coming of the bridegroom. It's written in the stars, it's written in the sky, it's written in the heavens, and it's written right in our bodies. And it was written in the sun shining on my face right at that very moment. You can't orchestrate this stuff, right? I really believe this sun shining right here is God speaking to us right now to confirm this beautiful, beautiful mystery. And the sun is so bright, it's blinding me. I can barely read uh, my Magnifica here. Wherever the river flows, every sort of living creature that can multiply shall live. Shall, there will be an abundance of fish. There shall be fruit trees of every kind. Fruit trees. Hello. All of creation is life-giving. All of creation bears fruit. All of the living creation is called to reproduce itself. We are part of this. Our bodies reveal this mystery. Fruit trees of every kind, and nor shall their fruit fail. They shall bear fresh fruit. They shall be watered by the flow from the sanctuary. That flow of water from the church, from the temple, is a life-giving source for the whole world and for all of creation. All of creation is taken up into this glorious mystery. Their fruit shall serve for food, their leaves for medicine. Astoundingly glorious mysteries. Now we go on to the psalm. The waters of the river gladden the city of God, the holy dwelling of the Most High God. The holy dwelling of the Most High. So here we can go back to Mary, right? Whenever you think dwelling of the Most High, it's fulfilled in Mary. Her body literally became the dwelling of the Most High God. And there is a river that flows through the city of God, this holy dwelling. And we can see that river as a symbol, can we not, of the Holy Spirit flowing into Mary, flowing through Mary, flowing into her body, gladdening her, giving her joy, the joy of the bride who conceives virginally the eternal Son of of the Father. There is a river that flows through the city of God to gladden the city, the holy dwelling of the Most High God. And we are called to enter in, to receive this Holy Spirit who flows in and through us to gladden us, to gladden us, to bring us into these holy mystical nuptials that we too can bear forth new life, eternal life. This is confirmed in the first reading of St. Paul, his first letter to the Corinthians. Listen to this. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, flows into you to gladden you? This is glorious. Do you not know you're the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Woo! If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. Pause right there. Let that sink in. If you, like me, were raised with this heretical idea that your body is not holy, that your body is somehow bad, that your body is somehow evil or twisted, that the spirit is good and the body is evil, let this truth sink in. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that temple is holy. Everything about your body is holy. 
St. Paul tells us elsewhere, he says, those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, these parts of the body deserve all the greater honor because it is these parts of the body, let's be more specific, the parts of the body that reveal the sexual difference and the call to holy communion. These parts of the body are all the more holy precisely because they reveal this call to life-giving love. They reveal this call to holy communion. Glorious, glorious, glorious truths. Our bodies proclaim the mystery of God. Our bodies reveal the holiness of God. That call to communion of male and female in one flesh is a holy communion. And this is why the enemy is after our bodies to twist and disorient our understanding of our bodies, to make us hate our bodies as much as he hates our bodies so that we don't discover the holiness of the body, so that we don't discover the goodness of our bodies, so that we don't discover that our bodies tell God's story, tell this eternal, beautiful, wonderful story that God wants to marry us. And it's all coming together for us in the gospel here. This is the gospel where Christ comes into the temple and casts out the money changers. What light does the theology of the body shed on this? Take these out of here, Jesus says. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on with the body today? Has not the body become a marketplace? Is not the body being sold as an object, as a thing, for people's sexual uh, gratification? Do we not live in, a, in a, a pornographic marketplace where the body is bought and sold and treated as a thing? We have made, in this pornographic culture, we have made of God's temple a marketplace. And scripture says, zeal for your house will consume me. Christ will come at some point. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know at what moment. But zeal for the body, zeal for the temple. And remember, the temple is our body. It will overcome the Lord and he will come and cast out the money changers. He will cast out this pornographic distortion. He will cast it out and he will insist we no longer make a marketplace of the human body. What's the justification for making this connection? Christ himself makes the connection. What's the sign you can offer for doing this? Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Our body is the temple. Today the church is celebrating the dedication of the mother church, the Pope's Cathedral in Rome, St. Lateran Basilica, right? Uh, or the Lateran the latter Basilica. This celebration is really and truly a celebration that the church is bride and mother. And so this celebration is a celebration of the theology of our bodies that tell this story. If you, like me, have been wounded and, and, and pained by all that's going on in the world where the body is being bought and sold as a pornographic object, let us take comfort. The Lord, the bridegroom, is coming to cast out the money changers. He's coming. It says in the book of Revelation that the whore of Babylon will collapse in an hour and all her revelries and all the prostitution and distortion of her beauty will collapse. All the money makers, all those who profit from her harlotries, all of it, the whole edifice of, cor of the sexual corruption will collapse in an hour, it says in the book of Revelation. But here's the point. Here's the point. In the collapse of Babylon, what shines is the beauty of the bride. In the collapse of all of this, the distortions, the body doesn't get thrown away. The body gets purified and fully redeemed. The body becomes immaculate, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, without any such thing. This, I believe firmly, is what Mary means 
when she said to those children in Fatima almost a hundred years ago, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. The mystery of the bride in union with the bridegroom, bringing forth life-giving love to all the world. This is the triumph that awaits us. John Paul II himself said, how do we recognize the difference in the book of Revelation between the, the bride, the heavenly Jerusalem, and, the, and the, the whore, Babylon, the one who mocks the bride? How do we recognize the difference? Both are stunningly beautiful. Both are very attractive. But one is mocking the other. One is mocking the other. And John Paul II said the key distinction between the bride in the book of Revelation and the mockery, the whore of Babylon in the book of Revelation is this. The bride is pregnant, whereas Babylon chooses barrenness as if it were good. My brothers and sisters, where does the sexual difference matter? The sexual difference matters in the call to be fruitful and multiply. But when we render our genitals unable to generate, eventually we degenerate. And we have no longer any understanding of why God made us as engendered beings, male and female. The very meaning of the word gender basically means the manner in which you generate that's what gender means at its deepest level, the manner in which you generate. When we for several generations have been trying to render our genitals unable to generate, what happens? We no longer have any idea of the meaning of gender. And when we have no idea about the meaning of gender, guess what? We have no idea about the meaning of Christ's love for the church because Christ's love for the church is all about regeneration. If we don't understand the natural reality of generation and we don't embrace the natural reality of generation, how can we enter the supernatural reality of regeneration in Jesus Christ? <laughs> Woo! These are all the things that are at stake in the debates today about the meaning of sex, gender, marriage, the family. All of it is at stake. What? Nothing short of the great mystery of Christ's love for the church. And for such a time as this, have we been given St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Please become more involved. Please share this video. Please share the resources from the CORE Project about Theology of the Body. Please become a member of the CORE Project to help us get this message out there. I'll post a link at the end of this video uh, right in the Facebook feed here where you can learn more about becoming a member of the core project and helping us get the theology of the body out to the world. I'm convinced if we can get this message out to the world, we can make a big difference. Before I sign off, let me just give a shout out to several people. We have Teresa Marks. This makes me adore the new life I carry within me now so much more. Bless you, Teresa Marks. Pregnant Teresa Marks, you are an icon of the incarnation. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Marie Hyman, hello, hard reality for those who cannot generate to understand. I hope they dig deeper to see what JP has to say about that as well. Very important point. My brothers and sisters, physical generation is not the be all and end all here. What we're talking about is spiritual generation. And more are the children of the barren woman, it says in scripture than of she who bore children. Why? Spiritual fecundity, fecundity is the be all and end all. This is where we're headed to spiritual fecundity, to spiritual life givingness. Physical fecundity, physical life givingness is just a little glimmer, a little sign of the ultimate reality. Isn't it interesting? We live in a world where on the one hand, we totally devalue physical generation. But then on the other, we have so many people suffering, longing for children. If you want to come to a deeper appreciation of the gift of human fertility, talk to a married couple who's unable to have children. It is one of the bitterest, bitterest most painful sufferings I've ever encountered in this life, talking to these couples. But right there, that sorrow, that suffering is fertile. It's life-giving. Please, please learn more about spiritual fertility. It's real. It's real. 
and it flows in a very particular way from the suffering of those who are unable to have children. A few more shout outs out there. Mary Valla, God bless you. Uh, Michelle Shaler Walton, bless you. Christopher Geis, right on, dude. Thank you. Well, thank you. Christopher, good name, by the way. Um, Marie Hyman, thank you for speaking on that. You are very welcome, Marie. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for chiming in and joining me here today. Share this video with friends and family. Help get the link out there. Thanks for helping me to do the work that I do. And stay tuned for that link to learn more about how you can become a member of the CORE Project. Uh, one more shout out here. Andre Andrea Perry, you're welcome, Andrea. Sean Douglas, you're welcome. Powerful, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Joel Patrick, God bless you. Emmanuel J. Gonzalez, God bless you. You're writing from Valladolid, Spain. Never heard of it, but wow, I hope I'm saying that right. Valladolid, Spain. Today I gave a talk for young men at Salamanca, and that's all you're saying. Can't read the rest. Min Nat Lee, you're too awesome. Please share more. I'll be happy to. Stay posted on Facebook here and join the CORE Project to learn more. Kathleen McMahon Hubbard, the sorrow and the suffering itself is fertile. Yes, yes it is. I'm going to sign off for now, everybody. Thanks for being part of this video today. Share it with friends and family. Till next time, take care.